thank you, Mr. President, uh, Ambassador Peckstein. Uh, speaking on behalf of the United States, we offer congratulations on the assumption of uh, your assumption of the conference presidency for the first part of this year. We are fortunate to begin with Belgium uh, in the chair. I also give a special thanks to our permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament, Ambassador Robert Woods, uh, who has done important work as our representative. It is a pleasure to be with you here today as we convene the next session of the CD. <clears throat> this is an organization that has played historically such an important role in safeguarding peace and security in the past, and one which could do so again in the future. Although I must say the behavior of Turkey and Iran uh, this morning calls that into doubt. I particularly urge Turkey to reconsider, as you will be known by the company you choose to keep. Tomorrow here in Washington, former Vice President Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th President of the United States. As the outgoing President's advisor and his envoy, and as the Undersecretary, uh, as the Acting Undersecretary, I and the State Department team here have worked very closely over the past month with the incoming U.S. Administration. At the end of the day, of course, as Americans, we all sit, swear the same oath of allegiance to our Constitution, and we all labor faithfully to serve the same nation. For those of you who are democracies with whom we have treaty alliances uh, in both Europe and Asia, you can be reassured that there is an enduring and an unwavering commitment to our collective security. For those of you, like Iran, who are adversaries of democracy, who violate international accords, who subvert the rule of law, and who undermine international norms, there will be no lessening of America's determination to hold you accountable, to expose your behaviors, and to impose consequences. In these respects, America's foreign policy will hold the same course bearing and heading as it has since our founding. Now to the matter at hand. It is not a flaw that the security policy of nations, particularly in the field of arms control, is often guided by lofty visions of idealists. That is laudable. The fatal flaw arises when idealism is married with naivete. History records those who ignore the reality of how the world is and instead fantasize about the world as they wish it would be as being destined to failure or worse, to incentivize aggression through appeasement. In this respect, things such as the TPNW are examples of highly counterproductive arrangements. History records those who proceed from a recognition of what is and who work from positions rooted in reality as true statesmen who have strengthened global peace and stability through their words and their deeds. The sad reality that we face today is that we have a global arms control infrastructure that has been deeply corroded by the actions of countries such as Iran, but also by nations such as the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. This is lamentable, but it is the truth. We cannot wish it away or ignore it. If we are to establish a new and better global arms control framework, we must begin with an understanding of how eroded have become certain fundamental principles, such as transparency, confidence building, verification and compliance, and good faith, even today, we've seen the principle of participation of sovereign nations, sovereign UN members, uh, as, as now under attack as a principle in the Conference on Disarmament. We also must understand that we have entered a new era of arms control. The Cold War era approach, which relied upon multilateral solutions for some things, but reserved uh, between superpowers bilateral arrangements to avoid nuclear weapons arms races, this is over. Henceforth, only multilateral solutions will have the potential to be enduring. They may be large multilateral agreements, such as those that can be fashioned in the CD, or smaller trilateral accords, as should be the case for future nuclear arms limitations. But they will all be multilateral in some fashion. Over the years, the Russian Federation has become increasingly reliant on nuclear weapons. They've adopted a provocative nuclear doctrine that embraces early escalation and use of nuclear weapons. It is vital, given this stance, that Russia reassure the international community that they continue to agree that the laws of armed conflict, particularly the concept of proportionality, applies with regard to nuclear weapons, and I urge our Russian colleagues in their intervention to state unequivocally that they continue to do so. The United States is concerned, in keeping with Russia's new doctrine, that they are building and modernizing an arsenal of thousands of nuclear warheads that are completely unconstrained by the New START Treaty. More than 60 or 70 percent of Russia's nuclear arsenal sits outside of any form of arms control limitation, and the size and variety of nuclear weapons being deployed on tactical and shorter range systems is surging. Today, Russia has far more nuclear weapons 
or warheads meant for non-strategic systems, uh, such as short and medium range missiles and torpedoes and landmines and so on, than it does for systems covered under the New START treaty. Indeed, President Putin seems to have walked away from the presidential nuclear initiatives that were affirmed by his predecessors, as well as past U.S. presidents. In light of this, and in light of Russia's destabilizing projects such as Poseidon and Skyfall, which do not fit within any deterrence framework, we've been unable to reaffirm the Cold War era joint statement that, quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. We agree with that principle, but no U.S. president, no leader of any nation, should play the game of reaffirming something with Vladimir Putin when we suspect he really doesn't believe it. It seems, in fact, that Putin and his inner circle think perhaps nuclear war can be won, and Russia is constantly wargaming and exploring how to fight one with NATO. All right-minded nations in the CD today should encourage Russia to abandon the flying Chernobyl cruise missile called Skyfall and the undersea version called Poseidon, and to stop adding hundreds upon hundreds of nuclear warheads to its arsenal every year. I urge others to join us in calling on Russia to be truthful about the fact that it is engaged in nuclear weapons tests with yield at Novaya Zemlya, despite its pledge not to do so. The United States is not engaged in such testing, and we are not engaged in any nuclear weapons buildup, but Russia is. We urge Russia to stop. Speaking of other nuclear weapons developed by Russia, nothing has done more harm to the global arms control architecture than Russia's brazen violation of the INF Treaty. Russia destroyed the INF Treaty by cheating. We now know cheating for more than a decade. They secretly produced, tested, and have now deployed an intermediate-range nuclear-tipped cruise missile in direct contravention of that treaty. The Russian military now fields multiple battalions of these SSC-8 missiles. The United States, on the other hand, does not field any similar systems. Unlike Russia, we honor our treaty obligations. Our approach to arms control is very straightforward. When we make a deal, we keep our end of the deal. We keep our commitments and we expect other nations to do likewise. Russia failed to do so and the INF Treaty fell casualty. Now Vladimir Putin is attempting to solidify his exploitive advantage by calling for an INF moratorium. This is a bad faith arms control gambit that America and our allies have rebuffed. We must remain clear-eyed and vigilant. No country should stumble into Vladimir Putin's INF moratorium trap. Instead, there will be consequences for Russia's behavior as we move to protect our friends and our allies in both Europe and Asia. We will field conventional intermediate range capabilities in the next two to three years, which will give us a mobile and survivable response to hostile actions. When paired with other emerging capabilities and cooperative defense postures, these systems will bolster deterrence. We will work closely with allies on interoperability and exportability matters, and we are committed not to allow Russia to gain any advantage from its sabotage of the INF Treaty and that arms control architecture. Sadly, Russia's violations of arms control agreements are not limited to the nuclear arena, but in the interest of time, I'll summarize simply to say that we view it unacceptable that Russia would use a fourth generation nerve agent, the Novichok nerve agent, in the attempted assassinations in Skripal, as well as against the opposition leader, Navalny. Russia is clearly maintaining an undeclared offensive chemical warfare program in violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And we have significant concerns about Russian activities that are precluded by the Biological Weapons Convention as well. We all know that Russia has systematically dismantled conventional arms control in Europe. It abandoned the CFE Treaty. It's not implementing the Vienna document requirements and it's preventing modernization of that accord. Russia's continued occupation of Crimea, parts of Georgia and Moldova, and their unconventional warfare operations in Ukraine, all are blatant violations of the UN Charter as well as the Helsinki Final Act. Russia is also engaged in multiple violations of the Open Skies Treaty and abused that treaty for purposes for which it was not meant, particularly to gather intelligence on critical infrastructure in the United States and on our allies in Europe. This is regrettable, and this led the United States, again, with no option but to withdraw, given that the treaty had no enforcement mechanisms. Now I observe Russia is attempting to blackmail NATO nations with their withdrawal after having defeated the basic object and purpose of this treaty through its own actions. These actions are not transparent. They do not build confidence. They are violations of international law. Given this, no conversation of arms control with regard to Russia can be complete without verification discussions. I know many of you are familiar with that old phrase, trust but verify. An agreement with Russia, with any country, that cannot be verified is not worth the paper upon which it's printed. Further arms control agreements must be complete, effective, and verifiable. Now, despite all of the headwinds we face in working with Russia, and they are significant, 
we have nonetheless made important progress on this front and the momentum should not be allowed to fade. Notwithstanding all of the behaviors I've cataloged, uh, we nevertheless have indicated a willingness to extend the New START Treaty, provided that Russia stop its arms racing. Several weeks ago, in exchange for an extension of New START, President Trump offered President Putin an opportunity, an historic opportunity, to place a cap on both countries' nuclear stockpiles, covering all nuclear warheads. This is something both of their predecessors were never able or willing to do. This was a bold and an unprecedented proposal, and we were pleased to reach agreement at the highest levels of our respective governments. Of course, to finalize this agreement, we will need to define a few things, specifically exactly what we're freezing and the respective levels at which we will freeze. Unfortunately, Russia has declined our offer to meet on four occasions to finalize these details. This is regrettable, as we were, and in fact we still are, if pressure is kept on, at the brink of an historic agreement. Covering all nuclear warheads is a crucial part of a complete agreement. President Putin has now publicly agreed to cap the total warhead levels, and we urge Russia not to backtrack. This is now the minimum threshold by which future nuclear arms control agreements with Russia, and subsequently with China, will be judged. This is one area where we believe the time is ripe for concluding a new arms control framework, again, first with Russia and then with China. I cannot say the same with regard to detailed discussion of space. The time may come for that, but we must not put the cart before the horse. We must first develop clear norms and expectations for behavior in outer space. I would offer in particular that the uh, draft PPWT uh, is deeply flawed. It's clearly drafted with ulterior motives as its main proponents are actively developing and deploying weapons that are designed to attack sat satellites in space. Some of these capabilities would be covered by the draft treaty, but there are significant exceptions. Uh, we'll discuss those further as these discussions evolve, but we feel that it is essential first and foremost before launching into arms control negotiations on outer space to define what norms of behavior can be developed to reduce risk of miscalculation particularly as the risk continues to grow with both reckless Russian and Chinese behavior. Returning to Earth, as I mentioned at the beginning, many re remain trapped in a Cold War era binary mindset when it comes to nuclear arms control. The reality, unfortunately, is that China is engaged in the single greatest expansion of a nuclear arsenal since the advent of the Cold War, and they're doing it behind a great wall of secrecy. The same country that is running concentration camps for Uyghurs crushing peaceful protests in Hong Kong, has attacked Indian troops on their side of the border, fabricated maritime boundaries by building islands in the South China Sea, and which wants to invade and destroy Taiwanese democracy, is now engaged in a crash nuclear buildup. China doesn't want you to know the truth. There's an old saying, hide a dagger behind a smile. China would have nations believe that the size of their deterrent is really nothing different from the United Kingdom or France, and you probably will hear some of that today or in the future during the PRC's intervention. In reality, the situation is far different. And to expose this deception, the United States has declassified a wide range of intelligence on China's clandestine buildup, including images from China's 2019 military parade. In that parade, the PLA's display of missiles stretched more than two and a half miles, nearly 10 times longer than it did a decade ago. Over that same time period, China's missile production capacity has grown by 180%. They're building an impressive array of missile systems, including many types of road and rail mobile ICBMs, silo-based launch on warning ICBMs, submarine launch ballistic missiles, and 18 different types and variants of INF nuclear capable type missiles, both ballistic and cruise. In fact, China has deployed more than 1,200 such missiles so far. And of course, China doesn't plan to let these weapons collect dust. In 2019, China launched at least 225 ballistic missiles, more than the rest of the world combined. And that was the same was true in 2018. Even this year, with COVID uh, sucking the energy, the resources, the time and the attention of nations worldwide to fight a virus that China let spread, uh, they broke their own record, launching 250 missiles in this past year. We are witnessing a dramatic shift in China's nuclear posture. In 2015, they claimed to be interested in only maintaining a lean and effective nuclear force. Just four years later, that phrase was retired and the intention with it. While they continue to tout their so-called no first use policy, it's clear the policy is propaganda, not policy. Not only is it riddled with caveats, 
but the systems they're building and deploying prove that it's not genuine. An example is China's claim that it won't threaten non-nuclear weapon states with nuclear weapons. Why then has China deployed the DF-21A at Chishu, where it can only hit non-nuclear weapon states uh, other than China's treaty partner, North Korea? For more than a year, we've been calling on China to negotiate in good faith in order to prevent a dangerous and unprecedented three-way nuclear arms race. As all nations of the CD know, China is legally obligated to do so. It is deeply regrettable that they have chosen not to honor this legal obligation. The United States is now concerned regarding China's compliance with its Article 6 obligations. In the days to come, it is imperative that China be reminded of this obligation. It is essential that all peace-loving nations continue to urge the Chinese to the table. Many have done so already. However, a number of handful of, of nations that historically have been vocal on the importance of nuclear arms control have to date remained silent. We're at a critical juncture, and now is the time for the idealists to join with the realists to avoid the perils of a three-way nuclear arms race, unlike anything experienced during the Cold War. Now is not the time for naivete. It is time to multilateralize nuclear arms control. It is time for Russia to finalize with the incoming Biden administration the details of the Trump-Putin agreement. And to, we, I ask all nations to urge Russia to step forward and complete what we've begun and to remind China that they, in fact, must negotiate in good faith, both with us and the Russians, on effective nuclear arms control mechanisms, and we should hold them to it. I've highlighted today the dangers this body and others like it will be called upon to confront in the days to come. We've ex exposed some of the corrosive behavior that has damaged the international arms control framework. There can be no equivocation or timidity in addressing these threats to global peace and security. Frank conversations like these are important. The first step in resolving any problem is to identify the problem, to expose the lie, to name the danger. This is necessary, and nations and individuals who have the courage and moral fortitude to do so deserve our respect and praise. But this is not sufficient. When countries or individuals behave recklessly or dishonestly, they must suffer the consequences. If they do not, faith in and respect for bodies like this one is eroded. Not only do bad actors lose what little respect they had for the institution, but even those who supported and respected the institution begin to waver. Now is not the time to waver. The stakes are too high. The United States looks forward to meeting these challenges together with our friends and allies and working through the Conference on Disarmament for the betterment of all mankind. Thank you, Mr. President.